Hi, welcome to my presentation on Chapter 10, Photosynthesis. So photosynthesis um, is, of course, important for organisms that you know, actually use it, like plants, but it also ends up being important for, important for most other forms of life uh, because it is the basis for the majority of food chains. Uh, photosynthesis is a way that organisms are able to extract energy from sunlight and use it to make ATP uh, and sugars. Uh, so in most food chains, at the base of the food chain, you have some type of photosynthetic organism, probably plants. Um, that would be shown, I guess, in this diagram here. The basis for the food chain here is these plants, the grass, and the trees. Um, energy is coming down in the sunlight, and these plants are able to harvest that energy through photosynthesis and use it to create ATP to fuel their needs and also sugars. And then they use those sugars to build structures in the cells, uh, and of course, to make more ATP and respiration. Uh, then you have some other uh, organisms in this environment, like rabbits or other herbivores, like maybe mice, uh, that are eating these different plants and extracting the energy uh, from them. So the rabbit is going to consume all of the carbohydrates that these plants have created uh, using energy from the sun. Then of course, if you have some predators in the environment that then eat those herbivores, like a snake eating a rabbit, and then some even bigger predators that eat the smaller predators, like an eagle that eats a snake or an eagle that eats a rabbit, um, the energy is moving up these levels in the food chain. So the snake is gonna absorb all the energy from the rabbit, the eagle is going to absorb all the energy from the snake. But ultimately that energy was created by these plants. These plants took sunlight and used it to make sugars that then the rabbit got and the snake got and the eagle got. Uh, and that makes the plants the basis of that food chain. So if you had some type of catastrophic event, event that killed all of the plants in that, in that field, um, all of the other animals, um, of course the rabbits would be in trouble. They don't have grass to eat. They're gonna have to die or go somewhere else. But also the snakes and the eagles are going to be harmed as well. Um, now there's not rabbits around there for, for them to eat and they're gonna also <laughs> either starve or go somewhere else to find food. Um, so if you're, if you're gonna take out the grass there, you're going to destroy every other organism in that food chain. Therefore, we are all really uh, essentially dependent on plants and their ability to do photosynthesis for our continued existence. That is true, as I said, for most food chains. The only exception to that would be that deep in the ocean, um, in certain locations like prominently around deep sea vents where you have kind of min minerals bubbling up from beneath the ground, um, you actually have some bacteria there that are able to make energy using minerals uh, that are coming up in those deep sea vents or that you find at other places on the ocean floor. Um, they're technically called chemolithotrophs, uh, which would mean stone eaters, basically. Um, so these stone eating bacteria are able to get energy from these uh, inorganic minerals, and they're the basis for the whole food chain that's around, uh, you know, the deep sea vents. So if you've ever seen like those weird looking worms and stuff that are down there and like the white crabs, um, those are all uh, getting their energy ultimately from those bacteria. Uh, but in basically any other food chain that you would find on planet Earth, you're going to find some photosynthetic organism at the base of it. Um, there are several types of photosynthetic organisms. Of course, we have plants. Um, all plants do photosynthesis. We also have algae and some bacteria. Uh, so you've probably heard the word algae before, but you might not know exactly what algae are. Uh, and they're actually kind of not very well defined, <laughs> uh, but they're basically any eukaryote that does photosynthesis, but it's not a plant. So basically, if it has a nucleus and it does photosynthesis, but it's not a plant, then it's algae. <laughs> uh, you also have some bacteria that do photosynthesis. Um, you know, in different lineages. So there's different types of bacteria that do photosynthesis. Most of them don't, but some of them do. Uh, the most important type of bacteria that do photosynthesis would be the cyanobacteria, which we'll mention again in a moment. And then we've got these two terms, autotroph and heterotroph. Um, so basically any organism can either be categorized as an autotroph or a heterotroph. And organisms that do photosynthesis are autotrophs. An autotroph is an organism that is able to make energy or obtain energy from some inorganic source, 
So that could be like an inorganic mineral, or it could be sunlight in the case of photosynthesis. Um, and yeah, so you're basically taking that inor inorganic source and stripping the energy out of it or harvesting energy from it, and that is your main energy source. Um, a heterotroph, on the other hand, is an organism that gets its energy from organic molecules. So that would be like you and me. Uh, you know, we can't make energy from sunlight or from eating rocks. We have to eat, uh, you know, maybe some salad or some meat. Uh, so we have to eat some type of organic um, material in order to get energy from it. Um, so the heterotrophs are always going to be stuck eating some other organism as a source of energy. An autotroph actually doesn't need to eat anybody. <laughs> it's able to make its own food um, using some inorganic source. Uh, and that would be the, the reason why you have organisms like plants at the basis of food chains. So at the base of a food chain, you're always going to have an autotroph, some organism that is making energy from inorganic sources, and then everything else is just, you know, eating each other. So photosynthesis, of course, is important because photosynthetic organisms form the basis for most food chains, but it's also important for other reasons. Uh, in fact, photosynthesis, um, is, and specifically oxygenic photosynthesis, is the reason why we have lots of oxygen in our atmosphere. So oxygen makes up about 20% of all of the gases in the atmosphere. Uh, but before you had um, oxygenic photosynthesis evolve, there actually was no oxygen, no oxygen in our atmosphere at all. Oxygenic photosynthesis is a specific type of photosynthesis that produces oxygen. So we're used to thinking of plants like needing carbon dioxide and then or they, you know, they kind of like breathe in carbon dioxide and they breathe out oxygen and then we breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. Um, so plants are doing oxygenic photosynthesis, which requires carbon dioxide and produces oxygen. You also have other types of photosynthesis that still require carbon dioxide, but actually don't produce oxygen. Um, but, you know, long ago, <laughs> many moons ago, uh, you had these little bacteria called cyanobacteria living in the oceans, and they evolved oxygenic photosynthesis. Uh, so not only were they using sunlight to produce energy, they were also producing oxygen in that same process. And at that point, that's when oxygen started to enter the atmosphere and the levels of oxygen on Earth started to rise. That was really important for life. Um, it's actually called the Great Oxidation Event, when cyanobacteria evolved oxygenic photosynthesis and started producing oxygen so that you actually had oxygen entering our atmosphere. Um, as the levels of oxygen in the atmosphere increased, uh, you ended up having some of the oxygen reacting with UV rays from the sun to create ozone, which is O3. Most of the oxygen in the atmosphere is O2, and ozone is O3. Um, and you have an ozone layer uh, high in the atmosphere that actually formed after cyanobacteria you know, started producing all this oxygen. And that ozone layer is really important for life because it blocks UV rays. Uh, in fact, it blocks the most energetic UV rays, which are called UVC rays. Um, and you know, before you had the ozone layer, all of those UVC rays were beaming right down to the surface of the Earth. And they have a lot of energy and they're very damaging to life forms. Um, now, UVC rays don't really make it to the surface at all. Uh, unless, of course, you have a hole in the ozone layer. Um, but most of them are blocked, you know, by the ozone layer. So they only get down to the upper atmosphere, and then they're kind of absorbed by the ozone up there, uh, which means that they don't get down to the ground to, you know, give us cancer. So that's really important for us. Um, but also, of course, <laughs> we do breathe in oxygen, and we use it for cellular respiration. Um, so all aerobic life, which would be all life forms that use oxygen for oxygenic uh, or for aerobic cellular respiration, uh, we're all depending on that oxygen in the atmosphere in order to give us a final electron acceptor um, for respiration. So uh, there was no way for that to, um, to you know, work before you had oxygen in the atmosphere, of course. So, um, you know, in order for us to have evolved doing cellular respiration the way that we do it, uh, you had to have cyanobacteria evolve first and start producing oxygen through photosynthesis. 
And of course, aerobic cellular respiration um, is way more efficient <clears throat> than fermentation at producing energy or producing ATP. It's also more efficient than anaerobic respiration uh, at producing ATP. So um, it is basically the best way that life has evolved to make ATP. Uh, and, it, and it does depend on the presence of oxygen in the atmosphere, so it could not have evolved or came, come to exist without the cyanobacteria uh, producing oxygen for us. So here we have the overall chemical reaction for photosynthesis. So in photosynthesis, you're taking six carbon dioxides, combining them with six waters in the presence of sunlight, and that creates one glucose and six um, molecular oxygens. O2 is technically called molecular oxygen uh, because, you know, it's two oxygens. Um, so just like for cellular respiration, this is the overall equation and it's kind of simple, but when you actually look at the process of photosynthesis, it's way more complicated and there's a bunch of like smaller reactions that are kind of hiding from this overall equation. So it's, it's a real big long metabolic pathway. Um, you also might notice that this is basically the opposite of the overall equation for cellular respiration. Cellular respiration is uh, one glucose plus six molecular oxygens um, produces six carbon dioxides and six waters. In photosynthesis, it's you're starting with the six carbon dioxides and the six waters, and you need sunlight, and then that produces one glucose and six oxygens. So this is the equation for oxygenic photosynthesis. There are other types of photosynthesis mm -hmm. that would have a different overall equation, but oxygenic photosynthesis is the, the type that we're kind of most familiar with because it's the kind that plants do, and it's the kind that we're gonna focus on in this chapter. Um, another note about this equation is that technically in photosynthesis, you're not producing glucose directly. Instead, you're producing a three carbon sugar and when you stick two of those three carbon sugars together, then that gives you glucose, um, which has six carbons. And then finally, <laughs> you notice that what, what you don't have in this equation is ATP, um, and photosynthesis is used to make ATP, but then all of that ATP is right away consumed to make the sugar. Um, so when plants are you know, running photosynthesis to get energy, usually what they're doing um, is making glucose and then they're going to turn around and use that glucose in some other process to actually make ATP. Um, so they could use it in cellular respiration. Um, that's what they would mostly do, actually aerobic cellular respiration with the glucose. But, you know, you could also use it in fermentation uh, to, make, to make ATP as well. When we were talking about cellular respiration, uh, one of the things we said about it is that in uh, aerobic cellular respiration, all of the carbons and glucose are fully oxidized to carbon dioxide. And that meant that they start out in these long um, nonpolar bonds in glucose and they end up in short polar bonds um, in carbon dioxide, where the electrons are actually more towards the oxygen side of the bond. So it's like the carbon lost those electrons, so it's oxidized. In photosynthesis, it's actually, well, you know, as makes sense, <laughs> probably, it's exactly the opposite. So you start out with oxidized carbons in carbon dioxide, and you're actually going to reduce them to glucose. So every carbon in photosynthesis, every carbon in carbon dioxide is fully reduced uh, to glucose. So you start out with carbon dioxide as one of your reactants. It has these short polar bonds. Because the bonds are short, they don't have very much energy in them. And the electrons are close to the oxygen side of the bond. So they're pretty far from the carbon and it's almost like the carbon is missing electrons because um, they're just hanging out next to the oxygen. All of these carbons and carbon dioxide are going to end up as part of glucose uh, after photosynthesis occurs. Um, when those carbons are in glucose, they're now involved in these much longer nonpolar bonds with other carbons or with hydrogens. So since these bonds are long, that means that they are high energy bonds. So you're taking carbon from low energy bonds to high energy bonds. Also, since these are nonpolar bonds, the electrons are going to be right in the middle of the bond, equally shared. So you're taking or you're going from bonds where the electrons are far away from the carbon and you're ending up at bonds where the electrons are close to the carbon. And that's the reason why we say that carbon is reduced in photosynthesis. 
Um, <clears throat> And the final point I'll make about this is that just since uh, since you're starting with <clears throat> low energy bonds and you're ending up in high energy bonds, that extra energy needs to come from somewhere. You have to add energy to this carbon dioxide to get those carbons to be part of high energy bonds and glucose. And of course, the energy source is sunlight for photosynthesis. So photosynthesis can actually be divided into two different processes. First, you have the light-dependent reactions, and then you have the light-independent reactions. And the light-dependent reactions are also just called the light reactions because, you know, they need light. The light-independent reactions are also called the dark reactions because they do not need light and they can go on in the darkness. Um, and there's also even more fancy names for them. <laughs> so the light-dependent reactions are also called photophosphorylation. The light independent reactions are also called the Calvin cycle um, out of the guy who discovered uh, after the guy who discovered them. Uh, so the light dependent reactions or the light reactions, as I'll probably call them, uh, are the ones that happen first. Uh, then you go to the dark reactions um, in the light reactions. The uh, reactants that you require are water and sunlight and NADP plus. Uh, NADP+, plus, you may remember, is one of our electron carriers. Um, it's not really used in organisms like you and me. We use NAD+, plus instead, um, but plants use NAD+, plus, NADP+, plus a lot, uh, specifically for photosynthesis. Um, so in the light reactions, you're going to be taking electrons off of the water and moving those electrons to NADP+, plus, which gives you NADPH. So one of the uh, products for the light reactions is NADPH. Um, after you've taken, taken electrons off of the water, that water is gonna be converted to oxygen. So the light reactions are also producing oxygen as a product. Um, and the energy uh, from those electrons that came from the water and went to the NADP+, uh, that energy is gonna be used to make ATP. So overall, the products for your light reactions are gonna be oxygen, ATP, and NADPH. Um, some of those products are then required for the dark reactions or the Calvin cycle. In the Calvin cycle, your reactants are gonna be carbon dioxide and then the ATP and the NADPH that you generated in the light reactions. So you have to have the light reactions happen before you can do the dark reactions. Um, the products for the dark reactions are glucose and NADP+. So you're going to take those electrons on the NADPH off of the NADPH, um, and it's, those electrons will be added to carbon dioxide in a process that is kind of combining carbon dioxides together until they make a glucose. Um, and it also requires ATP. Uh, so that's kind of summarized by this diagram here that shows the light reactions on top and the dark reactions on the bottom. So in the light reactions, uh, you have water and you're taking electrons off of that water. When you take electrons off of the water, it turns to oxygen. In order to get electrons off of water, you have to use sunlight. So it's actually not easy to take these electrons off of the water. It requires an external source of energy and that is the role of the sunlight in photosynthesis. Once the electrons have come off of the water, they're going to be added to NADP+, giving you NADPH. Um, and you're also going to be able to use them to make ATP. So uh, your reactants for the light reactions are water and light and NADP+. Um, this diagram actually has it a little bit backwards. <laughs> the P should come after the D, NADP+. <laughs> um, but yeah, so water, light, NADP+, as your reactants. And that's all being converted to NADPH, ATP, and oxygen in the light reactions then the NADPH and the ATP are gonna move on to the dark reactions, also known as the Calvin cycle. Um, in the dark reactions, you're taking carbon dioxide and converting it to glucose, um, or technically some other sugar, uh, and then you combine two of those sugars together to make a glucose. Um, so that process of converting carbon dioxide to a sugar is going to require electrons from NADPH, and it's gonna require energy from ATP. So the NADPH and the ATP that you produce in the light reactions are then used in the dark reactions um, to convert carbon dioxide to a sugar. Um, that means when you use that NADPH, 
you're going to be converting it back to NADP+. That goes back to the light reactions. And then, of course, for ATP, once you use it for energy, that gives you ADP and a free phosphate group. Those are going to go back to the light reactions as well to be recombined into new ATP. So the dark reactions in which you're taking carbon dioxide and converting it to sugar, that's actually considered something called carbon fixation. In carbon fixation, you're going to take some type of carbon in an inorganic format, like carbon dioxide, and convert it to an organic format, like glucose or some other sugar, that other organisms can use. It's called fixation because you're taking unusable carbon and converting it to usable carbon. So you're fixing the carbon so that other organisms can use it. So you and me, we need a lot of carbon, but we can't use carbon dioxide as a source of carbon. Um, we have to use something like glucose or some other organic molecule as a carbon source. Um, so for plants, they don't need to use organic molecules for carbon sources. They can use just carbon dioxide itself to get carbon so they can build all of their organic molecules that they need for the cell. Um, so in the Calvin cycle, that's actually where, that's actually how they're able to use that carbon dioxide to build molecules. They're taking in carbon dioxide, running it through the Calvin cycle, and they're putting it out as a sugar, and then from the sugar, they can get whatever type of organic molecule they require. Not only they can get it, but of course, if we then eat the plant, then we get it too. Um, so plants are basically taking inorganic, useless carbon and fixing it by turning it into sugars that then we get, we can use if we, if you know, if we eat the plant. Uh, so that makes the Calvin cycle very important for all forms of life, or maybe you know, not all, but most forms of life. And one final point to make here about the light reactions and the dark reactions is just that the NADPH that you produce in the light reactions has to turn over into NADP plus in the dark reactions. If you don't have a source of NADP plus, your light reactions are not going to go forward. They have to have NADP plus as a reactant or they cannot proceed. So you produce NADPH in the light reactions, that's for the dark reactions. In the dark reactions, you use NADPH and convert it to NADP+, and then that is used by the light reactions. If you don't have the dark reactions occurring, you're not going to get back your NADP+, to use as a reactant for the light reactions, then the light reactions will stop as well. So in a eukaryotic cell, like a plant cell that is doing photosynthesis, um, the photosynthesis, of course, is actually going to be happening in the specialized organelle that's for that purpose, which is the chloroplast. Um, if this is a bacterial cell that's doing photosynthesis, then it might have some specialized membranes where that's happening, um, but it's not going to be an actual organelle. If it's a eukaryote, so if it's a plant or an algae, then it's going to have actual chloroplasts where it's conducting photosynthesis. Uh, so this image is like a microscope image of a leaf, and you can see the leaf cells here, and you can kind of see these little green circles uh, within the cells. Those are actually chloroplasts, um, and here you have kind of more of a drawing of it. So it's those chloroplasts that are actually having a green color, and they actually make the whole leaf look green. If you zoom in on the chloroplast, you'll see there's a bunch of different membranes inside of there. Um, and if you make it into a drawing that's maybe a little bit easier to see what's going on, then it kind of looks like this. So you have your two membranes around the outside of the chloroplast, the outer membrane, then the inner membrane. Um, then inside the chloroplast, you have this empty space, and it has all of these discs inside of it. The empty space is called the stroma. Um, and then these discs, um, the, the individual discs are called thylakoids, but then most of them are arranged into stacks that are called grana, where one stack would be a granum and multiple stacks would be grana. So photosynthesis is happening in the stroma and it's also happening in the membranes that form these uh, thylakoid discs within the chloroplast. Then if you look in the interior of, of one of these thylakoid discs, you have a little empty space in there and that's called the lumen. So this is just kind of uh, a zoomed in view of, of the chloroplast structure. Um, so again, 
part of the uh, part of photosynthesis is happening in the stroma, which is the empty space within the the outer two membranes. Um, and then also you have these discs called thylakoids, and the stacks of discs are called corana, um, where more photosynthesis is happening. So technically, uh, the dark reactions, those are actually happening in the stroma, and then it's the light reactions that happen um, in these thylakoid discs or in the grana, or the stacks of discs. And then this diagram is basically showing that. Um, so here you have a chloroplast. Um, and you have the grana within that chloroplast. Um, the light reactions are happening in the grana. Actually, they're happening in the membrane of the grana. So that's the kind of the third membrane of the chloroplast. The innermost one is forming these thylakoid discs in the grana, and that's where your light reactions are occurring. So light comes in there. You also need water as a reactant, and you also need NADP plus as a reactant. Technically, also, I guess you need ATP, ADP, sorry, and a free phosphate as well. Um, so all, all those reactions are being combined in these light reactions that happen in the grana to form NADPH, also ATP, and also oxygen as your products. Um, then the ATP and the NADPH are going to go on to the dark reactions or the Calvin cycle, which is going to happen in the stroma or the kind of empty spaces between these stacks of discs. In the Calvin cycle, you're taking ATP and NADPH as reactants, also combining them with carbon dioxide as your final reactant, and that's kind of going to produce sugars. It's also going to produce NADP plus and ADP and a free phosphate, and those those uh, the NADP the <laughs> NADP plus and ADP and a free phosphate. Those are moving back. Uh, to the light reactions to, you know, to cycle again into ATP and NADPH. So now we're going to look at the details of those two sets of reactions. So we'll start with the light reactions, also called photophosphorylation, um, and then we'll look at the dark reactions or the Calvin cycle after that. So the light reactions use sunlight as essentially a reactant. That means they need to have some way of capturing light. And the way that plants and other photosynthetic organisms will capture light is by using uh, molecules that are called pigments. A pigment is just some type of molecule that is able to absorb certain photons, um, a photon being kind of the, the basic particle for light. Um, different pigments will be able to absorb uh, photons that are at different wavelengths or different colors of light. So here you have kind of a diagram of the electromagnetic spectrum, um, which is basically the, the different wavelengths of light that exist. Um, and in the middle of that electromagnetic spectrum, you have visible light, the type of light that we're able to actually detect with our eyeballs. Um, and you can see that it's separated into different colors by wavelength. So at the shorter wavelengths, it looks more blue, and at the longer wavelengths, it looks more red. And between those two extremes, it's running through all of the different colors that we're able to see. So different pigments will absorb light that is at specific colors or specific wavelengths, not just the whole spectrum of visible light. Uh, the wavelength of light is also related to the energy of the light. So the shorter the wavelength is, the more energy you have in that light. Uh, so blue light has more energy than red light. And that's why if you have um, a fire, if you have like a, uh, like a torch, <laughs> like a propane torch, um, you'll notice that the, um, the, the flame is actually blue, um, especially the innermost part of the flame is actually blue. Uh, because that is the part that is the highest energy and the highest temperature. So blue light is actually hotter than, than red light is. So a pigment molecule is able to absorb photons of light if they're at a particular level of energy, which would correspond to a particular wavelength and a particular color as well. So if, if the pigment is hit by a photon of light that is at the correct energy level for it to absorb, then it's going to actually um, take the energy from that photon and transfer it to um, an electron within the pigment. The pigment is only going to be able to absorb, um, you know, 
it will it won't be like just one wavelength of light it'll be kind of multiple some range of wavelengths um but if you're a photon coming in that's at a different part of the spectrum that's with that's not within the range that's absorbed by that pigment then you're not going to be absorbed by the pigment so if you're at the wrong wavelength the pigment will not absorb you and you'll actually just bounce right off um, and that's going to give that pigment some type of color so a normal object that doesn't have any color to it at all is just going to be reflecting all of the light that comes at it it's not going to absorb anything but if you have a pigment there um, then it's going to absorb certain wavelengths or certain colors of life of light and it'll reflect the rest and it's going to look like whatever it reflects um, so for plants the main pigment that they use to absorb light is called chlorophyll uh, chlorophyll is able to absorb photons that are in in the red range and in the blue range but it can't absorb in kind of in the middle between those so it can't absorb green light so when you have light coming into a molecule of chlorophyll, um, there's going to be a bunch of different wavelengths of that light, photons at different wavelengths, um, and the chlorophyll, chlorophyll is going to pick up and absorb the red and the blue photons, and it's going to have the green ones just bounce right off. And that means when you look at chlorophyll, you see green. You only see the light that's bouncing off of it, which is only the green light. So that's actually why plants look green to us. The green color is just coming from the fact that their chlorophyll pigment is absorbing other types of light, and it's not absorbing green light. So chlorophyll is the number one pigment that plants are using um, for photosynthesis. It's also used by algae and it's used by some bacteria. Um, there's a few bacteria that use other types of pigments like bacteria chlorophyll, uh, but most photosynthetic organisms are gonna be using chlorophyll as their pigment to absorb light for the light reactions of photosynthesis. Um, but they're also gonna have other pigments as well. Uh, in particular, they're gonna have carotenoid pigments. Um, a carotenoid pigment is basically, it's, not, it's, it's having kind of a protective role. So its job isn't really to absorb light for photosynthesis, but it's to kind of um, absorb extra light or really high intensity light. So if you end up having like super high intensity light, like sunlight is actually very high intensity, um, shining on a plant, um, you know, some of that light is going to be absorbed by the chlorophyll pigment in the plant, but um, the, the chlorophyll won't be able to actually absorb everything. And some of that light is actually able to cause some damage to the plant. So that's why you need to have another pigment, like a carotenoid pigment, to kind of absorb that extra light um, so that it doesn't end up damaging the plant. Uh, there's a bunch of different carotenoid pigments. Uh, they are, you know, different types are able to absorb light in different wavelengths, so they have kind of different colors. Um, but mostly they're going to be kind of looking yellow, orange, or red. Some of them look purple also. Um, so actually, if you go to the grocery store and you see like all the vegetables um, and fruits that have all those different colors in them, those extra colors are caused by the carotenoid pigments that they have. Um, also, in the fall, if you live in like a nice place where, where you have fall and the leaves turn colors, um, what's happening there is that the chlorophyll in, in the leaves is actually degrading as the temperature drops, um, you know, and as the year goes to winter. Um, and what you have left behind is just the carotenoid pigments in the leaves. So that's why the leaves turn all those pretty colors, all those yellows and oranges and reds. Um, and it's actually really important for plants to have those carotenoid pigments, even though they're not playing like a direct role in photosynthesis. But if you don't have them, like if you make like a, a mutant plant that doesn't have the carotenoid pigments and then you put it out in the sun, it's not going to last out there. Um, the, all the light is going to be damaging it and you're going to end up seeing that all the leaves turn just brown and decay uh, because the light is damaging the structures of the plant if you don't have the carotenoid pigments there to protect it. So the fancy name for the light reactions is photophosphorylation. And photophosphorylation is actually super similar to um, oxidative phosphorylation in cellular respiration. So just like oxidative phosphorylation, photophosphorylation also consists of two parts, the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis. 
The overall way it works is very similar. You have electrons entering the electron transport chain. They move along the electron transport chain to the end where they're added to some final electron acceptor. As they move on the electron transport chain, hydrogen ions, also called protons, are being pumped across the membrane to create a uh, hydrogen ion gradient that is then used by ATP synthase and chemiosmosis to create ATP. Uh, the details, the details of how the uh, electron transport chain works is a little bit different between photo, uh, photophosphorylation and oxidative phosphorylation, but the way that chemiosmosis works is basically exactly the same. So this diagram is showing, um, showing an overview of photophosphorylation. So you have the electron transport chain on top and you have ATP synthase for chemiosmosis on the bottom. Um, this membrane is a membrane of the thylakoid disc, so uh, photophosphorylation is always going to occur in the membranes of the thylakoids um, or you know, in the grana, which are just stacks of thylakoids. So you have all your different protein complexes of the electron transport chain. Some of these protein complexes are actually called photosystems. So you have photosystem two at the beginning of the electron transport chain, and then kind of halfway through, you have photosystem one. Um, and I know that's kind of weird for photosystem two to come before photosystem one. That's actually because they found the second one first. So first they found this one and they called it photosystem one. Then later on they found the actual first one, but they didn't want to change the name of the one they already found, so they just called the new one Photosystem 2. <laughs> um, but you actually don't need to remember like the order that they go in. Just knowing that it's Photosystems 1 and 2 is good enough. Um, so the first one is technically Photosystem 2. Uh, in these photosystems, that is where you have your pigments. So you have your chlorophyll as part of these photosystems, and that's where you're actually kind of absorbing light um, and transferring it to uh, actually to electrons. So in Photosystem 2, um, you have a bunch of pigments in here, um, a bunch of different chlorophylls in this photosystem, and light is coming in. The photons of light are striking the chlorophyll in this photosystem, and any of the pigments that are at a blue or a red uh, wavelength are going to get absorbed by the chlorophyll. So their energy is going to be transferred to those chlorophylls. Um, and you actually have the chlorophylls arranged so that they're kind of kind of funnel the energy into a central chlorophyll. So in the middle, you would have like one special chlorophyll that's going to absorb all of the energy from all of the photons that are absorbed by all the other chlorophylls in this photosystem. When that central chlorophyll absorbs all that energy, it's a lot of energy, and it's going to become a very high energy chlorophyll. <laughs> um, and specifically, that energy is going to one of its electrons. Uh, well, actually, I should say two of its electrons. <laughs> um, those electrons are going to be super high energy electrons. They're actually going to have so much energy that they don't stay attached to the chlorophyll anymore. So they're going to leave that chlorophyll and enter the electron transport chain. Um, but I said actually before that the electrons come from water. So what's going to happen next after the chlorophyll gets all this energy and donates its electrons to the electron transport chain, it's going to replace the electrons that it just lost by taking them off of water. So this central chlorophyll is then going to split water. Um, well, you know, it in combination with the other enzymes in this photosystem are going to split this water um, to get electrons off of it. Once you split the water, what you have left is oxygen and protons and electrons. The electrons are going to go to that central chlorophyll to replace the ones that have lost. So when this chlorophyll absorbs a bunch of light, it gets really high energy. It donates two of its electrons to the electron transport chain, and it's going to take two electrons to replace them off of water uh, when it splits the water. Um, it still has a bunch of the energy that it got from absorbing light. That's the only way that it's able to split water. Uh, splitting water takes a lot of energy to get it done. Um, and yeah, so that's, <laughs> that's how water is involved in this process. That's also how you're generating oxygen. So once the water has had electrons stripped away from it, you're left with uh, technically just one uh, atom of oxygen. But if this happens twice, then you're going to have two atoms of oxygen right there, and they're going to combine to create O2, which is what actually happens. 
Um, then you have these electrons traveling on the electron transport chain. They initially came from that chlorophyll, um, from that central chlorophyll on the photosystem, and they're just going to travel from one um, protein complex to the next on the electron transport chain. Um, when they get to photosystem one, you have more chlorophyll pigments there that are absorbing more photons. All of the energy from those photons is going to get transferred to those electrons, um, which is why I guess this, the, uh, the arrows here are kind of showing in a way the overall energy level of the electrons. So they're going to go up in energy here as they get a boost from the light coming in. So they get re-energized kind of at the photosystem one, and they continue on the electron transport chain until they get the, to the end of it. At the end of it, they are added to your final electron acceptor, which in this case is going to be NADP+. So NADP+, plus, plus those electrons from the electron transport chain, is NADPH, one of the products of photophosphorylation. Um, as these electrons are moving on the electron transport chain, the energy of their movement is going to be used to pump hydrogen ions, also called protons, across this thylakoid membrane into the interior of the thylakoid, which is called the lumen or the thylakoid space. Um, then you're going to be building up like large amounts of protons in this thylakoid space, and that is basically the whole point of running the electron transport chain in photophosphorylation, is building up um, a bunch of protons inside the thylakoid, um, and that is going to create a proton gradient across the thylakoid membrane, um, where you have a lot inside and only a little bit outside, and then that is useful, that gradient is useful for chemiosmosis. then chemiosmosis is going to work basically exactly the same in photophosphorylation as how it works in cellular respiration. So you have this protein, or should I should say this enzyme, ATP synthase. Um, ATP synthase is going to allow hydrogen ions to uh, flow through it across the membrane. They're going to flow down their concentration gradient, so they're going from the inside of the thylakoid to the outside, um, which would be the stroma. Um, as those protons move through the ATP synthase, it is going to use the energy of their movement to attach a free phosphate to a DP, giving you a TP. Um, then the ATP that you made from chemiosmosis and the NADPH that you made in the electron transport chain, both of those products are moving on to the dark reactions or the Calvin cycle. The oxygen that you made in photophosphorylation is actually considered a waste product by the cell. It's just going to be released. Um, some of it will end up being used in cellular respiration, but you know it's not going to stay here in the chloroplast. It's going to just leave. Overall, um, in, in, in photophosphorylation, you're able to make about one and a half ATPs for every electron that travels on the electron transport chain. So that's pretty efficient. So just to summarize for photophosphorylation, you have the electron transport chain and you have chemiosmosis. Um, in the electron transport chain, you have two photosystems uh, that have pigments, chlorophyll pigments to absorb light. Um, it all starts in photosystem two where you have photons of light absorbed by chlorophyll pigments there. Um, all of the light energy that is absorbed is going to be transferred to a central chlorophyll pigment, um, and it, that pigment is going to become very energized. So that chlorophyll, um, when it's all energized is, energized, is going to donate two of its electrons to the electron transport chain, and right away it's going to replace the electrons that it just lost by splitting water apart and taking two electrons from water. Um, if you split two waters apart, then that's going to give you one O2 um, and also uh, some protons and some electrons to go back to that chlorophyll. Um, the electrons that originally came from the chlorophyll that are now traveling on the electron transport chain are going to be traveling from one protein complex to the next on the electron transport chain. Uh, when they get to the next photosystem, photosystem one, um, you have more chlorophylls that will, abs will absorb light photons and funnel the energy to those electrons. So they're going to get a big energy boost at that point. Then they're going to continue traveling on the electron transport chain until they're added to NADP plus at the end to create NADPH which means that NADP plus is the final electron acceptor for this electron transport chain. Um, 
as the electrons are moving on the electrons transport chain, their energy is going to be used to pump hydrogen ions or protons across the thylakoid membrane, um, which is going to create a gradient, a concentration gradient for protons, where you have a lot of them in, inside the thylakoid in the lumen in there, and few of them in the stroma outside. Um, that gradient is going to be used in chemiosmosis um, to create ATP. So ATP synthase is going to allow um, protons to flow down their concentration gradient across the membrane and it's going to use uh, the energy of their motion to attach a free phosphate to ADP giving you ATP. Um, then your two main major products from uh, photophosphorylation which are NADPH and ATP are both going to move on to the Calvin cycle to serve as reactants for the Calvin cycle. Your other product is oxygen. Of course that is also very important but it's not um, you know it's not important for for photosynthesis. <laughs> We're done with this oxygen now. So of course you also have an electron transport chain in oxidative phosphorylation. Um, there's a lot of similarities between how the two electron transport chains work and there's also some differences. Um, the similarity is just that you have electrons moving from an electron donor to a final electron acceptor along the electron transport chain. As they move, as those electrons are moving on the electron transport chain, they're going to be losing energy, and that energy is used to pump hydrogen ions, also called protons, across the membrane. So that's the similarities. Um, then you have the differences. Um, so first you have a difference in the electron donor. Uh, for oxidative phosphorylation, which is shown by this graph over here, your two electron donors are going to be NADH and FADH2. So it's those electron carriers that you generate in the other processes of cellular respiration that are donating their electrons to the electron transport chain. Uh, in photophosphorylation, your electron donor is ultimately water. Um, so you're going to have this central chlorophyll donate its electrons after absorbing light energy and um, it's going to replace them by taking electrons off of water. So that means that ultimately those electrons have come from water. Um, you also have a difference in the final electron acceptor. In oxidative phosphorylation, your final electron acceptor is oxygen. So at the end, the electrons are added to oxygen, which gives you water. Um, in photophosphorylation, on the other hand, uh, at the end of it, your electrons are added to an electron carrier. So they're added to NADP+, giving you NADPH. So in oxidative phosphorylation, the electron donor is an electron carrier, and the electron acceptor, the final electron acceptor, is oxygen, which gives you water. In photophosphorylation, it's kind of the opposite thing. The electron donor is water, which then gives you oxygen, and the final electron acceptor is your electron carrier. Uh, finally, you have a difference in the energy of the electrons when they start and leave the electron transport chain. Um, so in oxidative phosphorylation, you start out with electrons that are on an electron carrier. They have high energy. Um, as they travel on the electron transport chain, they lose energy and they're added to the final electron acceptor oxygen. At that point, they have very little energy left at all. Um, so you start with electrons that have more energy and you end with electrons that have less energy. In photophosphorylation, it's kind of the other way around. You're starting with electrons that already have very low energy on water and you're ending with electrons that have a lot more energy on an electron carrier, which is kind of funky business because even though the electrons start with low energy and end with high energy, they're still losing energy as they travel on the electron transport chain. Uh, so the only way that that can work is if you have some extra source of energy, uh, and that's the sunlight, of course. So in photophosphorylation, you take these low energy electrons from water and you jazz them up with a bunch of sunlight energy till they become very high energy electrons. Then they travel on the electron transport chain, they lose energy as they move, um, and they're going to get to the next photosystem. At that point, you have more sunlight coming in. Um, and that's going to boost the energy of those electrons up to be really high again. Then they have a little bit more of the electron transport chain to move through, so they're going to lose some more energy, but they still don't lose as much energy as what they gained from the sunlight. So you're boosting them with sunlight twice. And that means that at the end, even though they also lost energy as they traveled on the electron transport chain, they're still going to have more energy um, at the end than they did at the beginning. 
So you also have some different types of photophosphorylation, which correspond to the different types of photosynthesis. So I already mentioned that you have oxygenic photosynthesis. Um, that means you also have oxygenic photophosphorylation. You also have anoxygenic photosynthesis, and you have cyclic. Um, so the simplest type of photosynthesis, or the simplest type of photophosphorylation, is actually cyclic photophosphorylation. Uh, in cyclic photophosphorylation, the electrons come from a chlorophyll, they travel on the electron transport chain in a circle, and go back to the same chlorophyll that they came off of in the first place. So it's called cyclic because the electrons are basically moving in a circle from where they started back to where they started. <laughs> um, in that case, the electron transport chain is generally going to be shorter than the one that we kind of went over already. And that's kind of summarized by this graph here. Um, so in cyclic photophosphorylation, you have a photosystem. Um, you're going to have chlorophyll pigments in that photosystem that are absorbing photons from light. All those photons are going to be transferred to the central chlorophyll. Um, and they're going to energize a couple of the electrons on that central chlorophyll. Once they get to be really high energy, they're going to be donated to the electron transport chain, and they're going to travel on the electron transport chain from one protein complex to the next and ultimately come back uh, to that chlorophyll that they came off of in the first place. As they travel, you're still using their energy to pump uh, protons across, across the membrane, so you're still... Um, you know, kind of running the chain in the same way to get the same uh, job done, uh, creating that proton concentration gradient. The only real difference is that the chain is shorter and your uh, electrons end up at the same place that they came from. Uh, that means that you don't need to have a final electron acceptor because the electron donor is also the electron acceptor. What, uh, so the, the type of photosynthesis uh, that we just talked about, or the type of photophosphorylation that we just talked about, is non-cyclic oxygenic photophosphorylation. Uh, it's non-cyclic because the electrons do not move uh, in a circle. They go from a starting point to an ending point, uh, from water to NADP+. Um, uh, you're also going to have a longer electron transport chain in non-cyclic photophosphorylation. Uh, and it's oxygenic photophosphorylation because uh, when you take those electrons off of water, you get back oxygen. So it generates oxygen. There's also another type of non-cyclic photophosphorylation, which is non-cyclic anoxygenic photophosphorylation, uh, which is similar. The only difference is that instead of taking electrons from water, you're going to take them from something else, maybe some type of sulfur compound, and that means that you're not going to generate oxygen, you're going to generate something else, maybe some type of sulfur compound. Um, so, you know, you're basically just not doing, uh, you're not generating oxygen uh, by operating the electron transport chain. Uh, so most photosynthetic organisms are able to do non-cyclic photophosphorylation, and they can all do cyclic photophosphorylation. So that means that even for plants, those are going to do non-cyclic oxygenic photophosphorylation as their kind of like primary type of photosynthesis. But if they uh, need to, or if they wanted to, they could switch to cyclic photophosphorylation instead. Um, they can just use their electron transport chain a little differently um, and do cyclic photophosphorylation. Uh, so that kind of gives them something to fall back on if they don't have um, final electron acceptors available or if they don't have electron donors available. Uh, one difference between cyclic photophosphorylation and the other types or the non-cyclic types is that it only gives you ATP. It doesn't give you uh, NADPH, so it doesn't add electrons to electron carriers um, in general. Uh, so, um, you know, another reason why plants might choose to do cyclic photophosphorylation is if they really need ATP, but they don't really need uh, NADPH. So, like, if they don't need to do the dark reactions, but they just need ATP, <laughs> then they can do cyclic photophosphorylation. Uh, so your cyclic photophosphorylation only gives you ATP. If you're doing uh, non-cyclic oxygenic photophosphorylation, that gives you ATP. It also gives you a NADPH. And it gives you oxygen, which is kind of a waste product, but not really. Like, it's a waste product as, as far as photosynthesis is concerned. Um, but then a lot of organisms would probably turn around and use that oxygen uh, in cellular respiration. 
Uh, but of course, they're generally going to produce more than they actually use in cellular respiration, so they still end up giving off extra oxygen, you know, to the to the outside world. Um, and then finally, you have uh, non-cyclic and oxygenic photophosphorylation, which gives you ATP and NADPH, but instead of giving you oxygen, oxygen is going to give you something else, and it's going to be some type of waste product. Uh, so here you have a couple of diagrams that are comparing um, cyclic photophosphorylation in plants to non-cyclic uh, oxygenic photophosphorylation in plants. Um, so on the top right is the non-cyclic diagram, and bottom left is the cyclic diagram. Um, so these are both using the exact same um, you know, chloroplast organelle. Uh, so the components of the electron transport chain are the same for both types. It's just that in cyclic photophosphorylation, you're actually not using all of them. You're only using part of the electron transport chain. So in your non-cyclic photophosphorylation, you start out with your photosystem absorbing photons from light. All that energy gets transferred to your central chlorophyll. Um, it becomes very energized. It's going to donate electrons to the electron transport chain. Then right away, it's going to use the rest of its extra light energy to, uh, to split water and strip electrons off of water to replace its missing electrons. That's going to give you oxygen if you do it twice. Those electrons that are traveling on the electron transport chain are going to be moving from one protein complex to the next until they get to the next photosystem where you have more light absorbed by chlorophyll that all gets funneled into the center and that's where you have your electrons coming in. So those electrons are going to be re-energized with more light energy um, and then they're going to finish out the electron transport chain and be added to NADP+, giving you NADPH. Um, as they're traveling, of course, you are pumping protons across the membrane. Um, that gives you your concentration gradient for protons that allows you to do chemiosmosis and run ATP synthase to make ATP. In cyclic photophosphorylation, uh, you're actually only using photosystem 1. So you have light uh, being absorbed by chlorophylls in photosystem 1. All that energy is being transferred or funneled to the central chlorophyll pigment. Um, that becomes very energized and then donates its electrons to the electron transport chain. But instead of those electrons going to the end of the electron transport chain, they're just going to kind of make a circle, <laughs> um, circle around to some earlier protein complexes and then end up flowing right back to that same chlorophyll that they just left from. So they're starting at this uh, chlorophyll and they're also ending at the same chlorophyll. Um, by the time they get back to this chlorophyll, it's already lost all of the energy that it absorbed from the light, so now it's able to accept electrons. When it's energized, it donates them. When it has low energy, it accepts them. Um, as the electrons move, they're also being used to pump hydrogen ions across the membrane, which again gives you your concentration gradient for hydrogen ions, also called protons, uh, that is then used by ATP synthase to make ATP. So in cyclic photophosphorylation, you're making ATP, in non-cyclic, you're making ATP, you're also making NADPH, and you're making your oxygen. So now we'll cover the dark reactions in more detail. Um, and again, the dark reactions are also called the Calvin cycle. Uh, as you remember, the Calvin cycle requires carbon dioxide as a reactant. So that means that plants need to be able to get carbon dioxide uh, from the air. However, uh, carbon dioxide can't just diffuse like from the air into the leaf just anywhere because leaves are always going to be coated uh, with wax. The waxy coating on the surface of a leaf is called the cuticle. Some plants have it really thick so you can actually see that the leaf looks waxy and for other plants it's thinner so you can't really see it but it is still there. Um, every plant will have a cuticle on its leaves to prevent water from seeping out through the leaf and just evaporating into the air. Um, plants would lose a massive amount of water through their leaves if they didn't have a cuticle. So the purpose of the cuticle is to prevent water loss, but it also has kind of a side effect of preventing gases from diffusing across the leaf as well, uh, which includes carbon dioxide uh, and oxygen as well. Um, so in order to get carbon dioxide into the leaf, leaves have uh, structures called stomata. Uh, stomata is the plural form, the singular is stoma. Um, 
so these stomata are just little pores in the leaves uh, where gas can, you know, get into and out of the leaf. Um, and they're surrounded by guard cells. Uh, so each stoma has two guard cells around it uh, that can close or open as the plant needs. So when plants need to take in carbon dioxide for the Calvin cycle, they're going to open their stomata uh, so that carbon dioxide can flow in. That also means that oxygen can flow out. And that means that they're going to be losing some water through the stomata. Um, and then if they kind of need to conserve water instead, then they'll just close their stomata uh, so that they're not doing any gas exchange, but also not losing any water. So this is an image of stomata. Uh, on either side, you can see the guard cells, and then there's the pore in between them. Uh, and these would be other, like, like regular <laughs> cells in the leaf. Um, and then this is kind of just a diagram showing that gases can flow through the stomata um, to get to all of these cells within, uh, within the leaf that are doing photosynthesis. So similar to the Krebs cycle, the Calvin cycle is called a cycle because the chemical that you start with is also the chemical that you end up with. So the Calvin cycle is this really complicated series of reactions uh, in which you start with a chemical called ribulose bisphosphate or RUBP, and uh, it goes through a lot of conversions to different molecules and you end up back with ribulose bisphosphate again at the end. Uh, in general, you can divide the Calvin cycle into three different phases, fixation, reduction, and regeneration. Fixation is the first phase uh, that refers to carbon fixation or converting inorganic carbon dioxide into an organic molecule that can be used by uh, any organism, basically. Uh, so in the fixation, uh, fixation uh, phase, you're basically taking carbon dioxide and attaching it to the first chemical in the Calvin cycle, which is the ribulose bisphosphate. So you're attaching carbon dioxide to RUBP. And there's a special enzyme that catalyzes that step. Um, of course, <laughs> every step in the Calvin cycle has an enzyme that catalyzes it. But this first step is like extra important because this is the step where you're actually taking inorganic carbon dioxide and converting it by incorporating it into an organic molecule. So Rubisco is the enzyme that catalyzes this first step. Um, and some scientists consider Rubisco to be the most important enzyme in the world. So previously we had talked about the importance of the sodium potassium pump, and it is super important, uh, but Rubisco might be a challenger for it because this enzyme is actually doing carbon fixation. So if you don't have Rubisco, then you don't have carbon dioxide being incorporated into organic molecules that anybody can use. Um, so that would be a problem for plants because they would not be able to use carbon dioxide in order to build uh, glucose and other carbohydrates that they need for the cell. Um, and that would be a serious problem for um, animals as well. <laughs> it would probably just mean that animals had never evolved in the first place, actually, if there was no rubisco, um, because we're relying on the carbon that is fixed by plants using this enzyme rubisco as a source for our carbon. So if we don't have plants using rubisco to fix carbon in this way, then we don't have a source of carbon, basically. I mean, I guess we could try to, like, eat bacteria, but... Um, well, you know, animals in general might have been able to evolve just eating bacteria, but it, that just doesn't seem uh, super likely. <laughs> so once you have um, carbon dioxide attached to, rubis uh, to, to Ruby P by the Rubisco enzyme, um, the final part of the fixation phase is just um, splitting that molecule in half. Uh, so Ruby P... Uh, or ribulose bisphosphate, it has five carbons in it. Uh, it's a five carbon uh, uh, molecule. Uh, so then when you attach a carbon dioxide to it using Rubisco, you get a six carbon molecule. And in the final phase of fixation, you're just going to split that six carbon molecule in half to get two molecules that each have three carbons. That's the end of the fixation phase. Then in the reduction phase, um, you are basically taking those three carbon molecules that you got at the end of the fixation phase uh, and converting them to a different three carbon molecule called G3P. In order to, um, to get G3P, you have to um, add a lot of electrons to it. So you have to reduce 
uh, the molecule that you get at the end of the fixation phase in order to end up with G3P. So that's why it's called the reduction phase. <clears throat> and it's going to require a lot of electrons from NADPH and it's going to require energy from ATP. Uh, then the last phase of the Calvin cycle is the regeneration phase in which you're basically trying to go from having G3P back to having RuBP, uh, your starting chemical. Uh, but there's an issue there, uh, which is that G3P only has three carbons in it and RuBP has five. And you also need to get some type of product out of this cycle uh, so that you can make glucose with it. So actually, the Calvin cycle needs to run um, three times. Uh, it needs to run three times to regenerate one RuBP. So you're going to have ultimately three carbon dioxide molecules entering the Calvin cycle, going through the fixation phase, then the reduction phase. Um, you're going to end up attaching those carbon dioxides to RuBP <clears throat> to get a six carbon product that is split in half. Um, so ultimately for, <clears throat> for three carbon dioxides, you're going to have six um, little three carbon molecules that get reduced to make G3P. So for every three carbon dioxides, you're making six G3P uh, through the fixation and reduction phases of the Calvin cycle. One of those G G3Ps is going to be removed from the Calvin cycle. Uh, the other five need to enter the regeneration phase so you can get back actually three <laughs> Ruby Ps, the same three Ruby Ps that you used at the beginning. Uh, to attach the three carbon dioxides to. So uh, you can't just have the Calvin cycle run one time in order to regenerate one RuBP. You have to have it run three times to regenerate three RuBP instead. Um, and for running it those three times, you will get one molecule of G3P as your product that is going to you know, leave the Calvin cycle. So that G3P is a really simple sugar, and if you just stick two of them together, you're gonna get glucose. So that means you actually need to use um, six carbon dioxides and run the Calvin cycle six times in order to get one molecule of glucose uh, made through the Calvin cycle. Oh, and then I guess the final point I'll make about the regeneration phase is just that it also requires uh, some ATP as well. So you need ATP in the reduction phase and the regeneration phase. You need electrons from NADPH only in the reduction phase. So here you just have a diagram summarizing the Calvin cycle that's a little bit simpler than the diagram on the previous page. Uh, so again, you're going to run the Calvin cycle uh, three times to get one G3P out of it, and you need two th G3Ps for one glucose. So you're going to run the Calvin cycle six times total for one glucose. Uh, but if you're running it three times to get one G3P, <coughs> you're going to start by having a carbon dioxide attached to a RuBP by the enzyme Rubisco. Uh, so RuBP has five carbons. When you add a carbon dioxide to it, you get a six carbon um, product. Um, uh, then that six carbon product is going to be split into two to make two three carbon products. Uh, that, that stage is called carbon fixation, starting with attaching CO2 to RuBP, ending with splitting that product into two three carbon molecules is carbon fixation. Um, then after carbon fixation, you enter the reduction stage, which requires ATP and electrons from NADPH. Um, and it's going to convert that three molecule or that three carbon uh, product molecule to a actual G3P mo molecule. Uh, actually, two of them, technically, for every carbon dioxide, you would get two G3Ps. Um, and then you need to do the regeneration phase, which requires that the cycle runs actually three times to regenerate uh, three RuBPs. And the regeneration phase also requires. Uh, a little bit of ATP, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit of ATP. Uh, as you are entering the regeneration phase from the reduction phase, you have your G3P made. If you've run the cycle three times, you're going to have uh, six G3Ps uh, at the end of the reduction phase. Um, five of them are going to enter the regeneration phase to form three RuBPs and one of them will exit the Calvin cycle as your actual product, the sugar that you have made. And if you, again, if you take two of those G3Ps and stick them, stick them together, you're gonna have one glucose. 
So again, you have to have two G3Ps generated through the Calvin cycle to get one glucose. Um, you need to run the cycle three times to get one G3P, so you would need to run it six times to get two G3Ps for one glucose. Um, but sometimes you might need to make a more complicated carbo uh, carbohydrate as a plant. Um, so the plants are going to be using the Calvin cycle to get glucose uh, so that they can do cellular respiration with it and make some ATP. Uh, but they're also doing it to get glucose so they can build structures in the cell um, that are built out of carbohydrates. Um, so in order to get you know, more, <laughs> more product out of the Calvin cycle so you can make more complicated carbs than just glucose, uh, you would just need to run it more times. Um, you run it more times, make more G3P molecules, and when you have more G3Ps, you can put them together to make larger and larger carbohydrates. Um, let's see, I guess a final point about G3P is just that it is also called PGAL. So depending on what source you're looking at, you might see G3P or you might see PGAL, but they're both the same thing. Um, in order to make G3P, uh, the Calvin cycle does require a large amount of ATP and NADPH. Uh, it actually requires uh, nine ATPs and six NADPHs for every one G3P that it produces. So for every glucose, you would actually need 18 ATPs and 12 NADPHs, which is quite a lot. Um, so all of that ATP and NADPH is going to be coming from photophosphorylation. So in the light reactions, you are basically generating the ATP and the NADPH that you require to run the Calvin cycle so that you can take carbon dioxide and use it to produce sugars for the cell. So normally, uh, plants would be running the light reactions so they can get ATP and NADPH for the dark reactions. Uh, that produce sugar. But sometimes the plant might not really need to make more sugars uh, at the moment if it has plenty. Then it could um, actually switch uh, the light reactions to doing cyclic photophosphorylation instead of non-cyclic oxygenic photophosphorylation. Um, and that way it would be making ATP in the light reactions still, but it would not be making an ADPH because you only make ATP in cyclic photophosphorylation. You don't make any NADPH. Uh, so if the cell were to do that, <clears throat> it would be making ATP using light, but it wouldn't be making NADPH. Uh, that would mean that you can't run the Calvin cycle. You have to have both ATP and NADPH for the Calvin cycle. So if you only have ATP and no NADPH, then you're not going to be you know, doing the Calvin cycle at all. Um, that would mean that plants are not using all of that ATP that was produced through the light reactions to run the dark reactions because the dark reactions aren't running uh, without NADPH. So the cell would be free to use that ATP for some other purpose. So sometimes cells, uh, plant cells will do that if they need ATP, but they don't need any sugar. So we mentioned that plants need to uh, stick two G3Ps together to make one glucose, uh, but they actually don't need to necessarily make glucose. They could also make other monosaccharide sugars uh, out of G3P um, just with simple modifications to it. Um, of one of the other monosaccharides they can make is fructose. And actually to transport sugar around the plant, they wouldn't just transport it as glucose. They would take the glucose and add a fructose to it to make sucrose. Uh, so once you have monosaccharides made from G3P, you can combine them together to make disaccharides. Um, and plants will, you know, <laughs> the main disaccharide that they'll make is sucrose out of glucose and fructose. Uh, and then sucrose is what they actually end up transporting around the plant in their vasculature. You can also um, combine those monosaccharides together in different ways to make the different polysaccharides that the plant needs. Uh, of course, primarily glucose. So if the plant needs to make starch <clears throat> or if it needs to make cellulose so it can, have, uh, so it can build cell walls, um, then it needs to you know, combine a lot of glucoses together uh, to make those polysaccharides. But basically any carbohydrate that the, that the plant needs, it can make um, out of G3P um, and the different monosaccharides that can be produced from G3P. So we'd mentioned that um, plants need to have a way to get carbon dioxide into, the, into their leaves in order to do the dark reactions. And that they do that using stomata. 
But when the stomata are open, not only can carbon dioxide get in, but water can get out. Uh, so if you have a plant that's in kind of really hot, dry conditions, like say out in the desert, <laughs> then that can actually become a problem because if you're having your stomata open so you can get carbon dioxide to run photosynthesis, you're losing water at the same time. Um, and there's not a lot of water in the environment. If a plant loses too much water, then it's going to wilt. And if it wilts, then the stomata are actually going to close just kind of by themselves. They're not going to be able to, uh, the guard cells won't be able to keep the stomata uh, propped open if the plant has wilted. Um, and if the stomata close, then you're not having carbon dioxide enter the leaf anymore. And that means you're not doing the dark reactions of photosynthesis to produce sugar. So that's basically what's shown in this diagram here. <clears throat> here you have a plant with its stomata open, so carbon dioxide is entering <clears throat> the leaves and the plant is doing photosynthesis. At the same time, it is losing water vapor through those stomata. If that continues to go on, and this is kind of a hot, dry day, um, where there's not a lot of water in the ground, maybe, to replace water that's being lost through the leaves, then you end up having the plant wilt. It loses too much water um, through its leaves and it's not able to replace the water that it loses from you know, water in the ground or from any other source. Uh, so it's gonna end up wilted and when it wilts, the stomata will close. Uh, when the stomata close, the plant is not losing water anymore, which is good, but it's not getting carbon dioxide in anymore either. And that means that photosynthesis is going to drop off. So plants are going to need to have a way around that if they're living in conditions where there might frequently, you know, <laughs> uh, it, you know, it might be kind of hot and there's not a lot of water around to replace water that they lose through their leaves. There's also another potential problem um, with having <laughs> having kind of the light reactions happening in the same place as the dark reactions or the same general location. I guess same chloroplast, uh, which is just that uh, Rubisco is able to bind oxygen as well as carbon dioxide, but you know, if it's bound to oxygen, then it's not able to actually catalyze the reaction that it's supposed to catalyze. So that means that oxygen actually inhibits Rubisco. Um, so if you have uh, kind of oxygen being produced by non-cyclic oxygenic photophosphorylation um, <clears throat> in the same chloroplast where you're also having the Calvin cycle run, um, <clears throat> you can end up having your rubisco be inhibited by oxygen and you're not going to have, uh, you know, the Calvin cycle running very well, basically. You're not going to really be producing uh, very much sugar if your rubisco is inhibited by oxygen. So this is another challenge that plants need kind of a way to overcome. Uh, and there's a couple of strategies that plants use to get around, um, you know, having to lose water when they lose carbon, when they get in carbon dioxide and having rubisco be inhibited by oxygen. Two of the main strategies that plants use to overcome these challenges are uh, the C4 pathway and CAM, which we will kind of finish the chapter out by talking about <laughs> a little bit. So starting, we'll start with the C4 plants. C4 plants have two different ways to fix carbon. So they have the Calvin cycle and they also have the C4 pathway uh, that they can use as well. So in the leaf of a C4 plant, some of the cells there will be using the Calvin cycle and some of them will not be using the Calvin cycle. Instead, they'll use the C4 pathway. Um, in the C4 pathway, you take in carbon dioxide and you have an enzyme, uh, PEP carboxylase or PEP carboxylase, that is going to add carbon dioxide to uh, this three carbon compound called PEP or PEP, uh, which is an organic compound. So when you add carbon dioxide to PEP, that gives you a four carbon molecule um, that, that you know, also includes like fit this fixed carbon dioxide. It's called the C4 pathway uh, because the molecule that you make when you add carbon dioxide to PEP has four carbons in it. In a C4 plant, the cells that are using the C4 pathway are going to be close to the surface of the leaf and the cells that are using the Calvin cycle will be deeper in the leaf, kind of closer to the uh, vascular tissue within the leaf. 
So it's those cells that are close to the leaf surface that would be exposed to more oxygen. Uh, and those are the cells that will be using the C4 pathway. Uh, one thing that's special about the C4 pathway is that the, uh, the enzyme that catalyzes the actual uh, carbon fixation, uh, which is PEP carboxylase, has a pretty high affinity for carbon dioxide, which means that it binds carbon dioxide very strongly. Um, it has a much lower affinity for oxygen, which means it does not bind oxygen very well. Um, so Rubisco is actually going to bind pretty well to oxygen, and it has a lower carbon dioxide affinity than, than uh, PEP carboxylase does, which means that it's easy for oxygen to attach to Rubisco and inhibit it. For PEP carboxylase in the C4 pathway, it's much easier for carbon dioxide to attach to it and much harder for oxygen to attach to it. Um, so it's probably going to be attaching to carbon dioxide and actually you know, performing the catalysis that it's supposed to perform on carbon dioxide to add it to PEP. Um, so uh, PEP carboxylase is not going to be very much inhibited by the presence of oxygen. Uh, so close to the surface of the leaf where you have more oxygen present, there you have cells that are running the C4 pathway. Uh, they're fixing carbon by attaching it to PEP um, and that generates a four carbon molecule as a product. Um, <clears throat> That, that uh, C4 pathway is actually another cycle, um, <clears throat> which means that you start with PEP and you're going to get PEP back at the end. Uh, so first you add carbon dioxide to PEP to get yourself a four carbon molecule. Then you need to split another, you need to split one of those carbons off of that four carbon molecule to get back to PEP. Um, so actually, <laughs> the molecule that you will split off of PEP, uh, or sorry, off of that four carbon molecule to get back to PEP, is just carbon dioxide. Um, and then you're going to have that carbon dioxide kind of diffusing deeper into the leaf uh, to reach the cells that are running the Calvin cycle. So that's kind of illustrated here. Um, here you have a view, a cross-section view of a leaf. Uh, this would be like a vessel that's running through the leaf. Uh, carrying you know water and sugar um, in the leaf and then you have your leaf cells and then the surfaces of the leaf. So these cells that are close to the surface would be running the C4 cycle and the cells that are kind of deeper within the leaf would be running the Calvin cycle. If you were to zoom in on some of those cells um, you might see something like this uh, where here you have a cell that's actually bordering the vessel in there that cell is running the Calvin cycle and then here you have a cell that is closer to the surface of the leaf and is running the C4 cycle. So you have carbon dioxide um, coming into the leaf and the C4 cells are going to attach it to PEP using PEP carboxylase in the C4 pathway uh, that gives you a four carbon compound as a product. Uh, later in the pathway carbon dioxide will actually be split off of that four carbon compound and that gives you back your PEP. Um, and then that carbon dioxide is going to end up being moved deeper into the leaf and passed off onto these Calvin cycle cells. And the Calvin cycle cells <laughs> will then use that carbon dioxide in the normal, the normal Calvin cycle, um, three carbon dioxides to make one G3P, which will end up entering that, uh, the vessel. Uh, by doing this, these C4 plants are able to kind of insulate their Calvin cycle cells from the presence of oxygen. Uh, and they're kind of, you know, they have this mechanism to directly deliver carbon dioxide to them without any, uh, without much oxygen coming by. Um, so that means the Calvin cycle is going to work more efficiently. Also, um, because the PEP carboxylase enzyme has a higher affinity for carbon dioxide than Rubisco does, uh, that means that it's really easy for that enzyme to kind of strip carbon dioxide out of the air. So it's going to be actually more efficient at extracting carbon dioxide from the air when air comes through the stomata. Uh, and that means that the leaf is going to be able to close the stomata more frequently in order to get a certain amount of carbon dioxide that the, that the uh, leaf needs. It doesn't need to have as much air exchange coming in and out. Uh, it can just have air exchange for a shorter period of time and still get the same amount of carbon dioxide. Uh, that means that it can close its stomata more and prevent water loss better. The other common adaptation to hot and dry conditions uh, is CAM, which stands for Crassulacean <laughs> Acid Metabolism. Um, it actually also involves the C4 pathway, uh, but it's a little bit different from actual C4 plants. 
uh, because you just have uh, both the C4 pathway and the Calvin cycle happening like in the same place within the same cells, uh, but they don't happen at the same time of day. So in CAM plants, they're going to run the C4 pathway at night um, and use that to kind of store up carbon, um, carbon dioxide. Uh, then in the daytime, they're going to use all that carbon dioxide that they store during the night in the Calvin cycle. Uh, so that means that at nighttime is when they're collecting carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So they would have their stomata open at night. Then during the day, they already have a big store of carbon dioxide built up in the leaf uh, that was using the C4 pathway. Um, and they're able to then close their stomata and still run the Calvin cycle on that stored uh, carbon dioxide that they kind of built up during the night. Uh, in general, you have to run the Calvin cycle during the day because you can only run the light reactions during the day, of course. You need light for them. Uh, and the Calvin cycle has to have the ATP and NADPH from the light reactions, but it's kind of hard to store those things kind of long term. Um, so you kind of need to like make them and then use them. So the Calvin cycle needs to run in the day with, with the light reactions. But the C4 cycle doesn't require as much like ATP and NADPH as the Calvin cycle does. It's a lot cheaper to run. So you can actually run it at nighttime when you don't have the light reactions running um, just to store up cal uh, carbon dioxide to be used later during the daytime to actually make sugars for the plant. That way the plant gets to have their stomata closed entirely during the day. So they don't lose water during the day through their stomata at all. Um, and at nighttime, of course, you don't, it's not as hot. So it's a lot easier to have the stomata open, but not lose very much water through them by evaporation. Uh, so this um, strategy, the CAM strategy, is going to be used by a lot of plants in the desert, particularly because it's very, um, is effective at allowing plants to conserve water uh, and still run the Calvin cycle and make sugars.